guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my channel. If you haven't done so already, and you know what I'm about to say, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe below. On this video, this is actually going to be part one out of a two-part series video on um, skin integrity, wound care, okay? Why? There's so many questions, so many concepts that are covered. I couldn't just cover it all in one video, so this is going to be part one. So let's just jump right into the questions. First question, pressure ulcers form primarily as a result of one, nitrogen buildup in underlying tissues, two, prolonged illness or disease, three, tissue ischemia, four, poor nutrition, and I'll give you a moment. And the correct answer is number three, the primary cause is tissue ischemia. So let me explain to you, because I know a lot of you guys wanted to choose choice number four, poor nutrition. Poor nutrition is a risk factor, okay? But one of the primary causes is tissue ischemia, okay? There's a difference between a cause and a risk factor. So let me explain this to you. What happens is, for whatever reason, the patient has been on that portion of the skin, which is usually a bony prominence, but they've been on that, uh, pressure has been applied on that skin for too long, okay? Whether it be due to that patient being emaciated and that's why they're on that bony prominence, or the patient's obese and that's why there's so much pressure on that site. Or it could be that the patient is um, incontinent, right? And so, um, the acidity of the urine or the wetness of feces, it starts to emaciate at the skin. You know, there could be a list of uh, things that places the patient at risk. But the point is that patient has put pressure on that site. When there's pressure on that site, guess what's not, <coughs> excuse me, guess what's not getting to that site? Blood. And along with blood comes oxygen, vitamins, nutrients. So what happens to that tissue? it starts to die, okay? It starts to be suffocated of not getting enough oxygen and that's what that tissue ischemia is. So that's a primary um, result um, of pressure ulcer tissue ischemia. Why? Because of all that pressure to the site. When you have pressure, you have decreased oxygen. Um, you have de When you have too much pressure, you have decreased blood. If you have decreased blood, that means you're getting decreased oxygen to the site. And along with decreased oxygen is decreased vitamins, de decreased nu uh, nutrients and minerals, okay? So don't be fooled. You see four poor nutrition? Poor nutrition is a risk factor. If that patient has poor nutrition, you know they're not having in, eating enough uh, uh, protein. They're emaciated or they're obese. It could be the opposite. Those can put that patient at risk. Pressure to go on the bony provinces, decreased blood flow. With a decreased blood flow, decreased oxygen, vitamin, nutrients, which lead to what? Tissue ischemia. So I hope that makes sense for you guys. Number one and two is just wrong, flat out. So you should have been between number three and number four. Those should have been your two choices. And between those two choices, I hope I kind of explained it and made it clear to you why three was the correct answer and not number four. But just for clarification, poor nutrition, being emaciated, being obese, being incontinent, um, having decreased level of consciousness, such as a patient who's sedated, such as a patient who's in a coma, all of those are risk factors for a patient um, getting pressure ulcer, okay? Next question. The nurse notes, uh, excuse me, the nurse notes a client's skin is reddened with a small abrasion and serous fluid present. The nurse should classify this stage of ulcer formation as one, Stage one, two, stage two, three, stage three, or four, stage four. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer is stage two. And here's the key, guys, that made you guys know the answer was stage two and not stage one. In the question, it told you that, yes, the skin's redden, 
But look, there's a small abrasion. What's this? There's a break in the skin. It can't be a stage one anymore. So a stage one is when that area is reddened. It's non-blanchable, right? But guess what? The skin is still intact. You're at a one. Once that skin's no longer intact, such as an opening or an abrasion, okay, you're now at skin two, skin two, you're now at stage two. And that's where that, um, the ulcer comes down to the dermis or the epidermis. Then you have your stage three. Stage three is when it gets down to the sub -Q layer, the fatty tissue, the sub -Q layer. And stage four is when it comes down to the bone, okay? So that's an easy way to remember your stages. One, Redden, non-blanchable, but the skin's still intact. Two, skin's no longer intact. The epidermis or the dermis is affected. Three, it's gone down to the sub-Q layer. Four, it's gone down to the bone. Okay? Next question. The client has rheumatoid arthritis, is prone to skin breakdown, and is also somewhat immobile because of arthritic discomfort. Which of the following is the best intervention for the client's skin integrity? One, having the client sit up in a chair for four hour intervals. Two, keeping the head of the bed in high phallus position to increase circulation. Three, keeping a written schedule of turning and positioning the client. Four, encouraging the client to perform pelvic muscle training exercises several times a day. I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. The correct answer, guys, is keeping a written schedule of turning and positioning. Why? Because when you keep that schedule, you're making sure that that patient is turning and repositioning at least every two hours. What does that mean? That means that pressure is not being applied to any given site for more than a max of two hours at a time. I want to go through these other choices with you. One, having the client sit up in a chair for four hour intervals. Well, we have a problem with that. Number one, in the question, it tells us that the patient's prone to skin breakdown and they're somewhat immobile because of arthritic discomfort. So if you're having that patient sitting up in a chair for four hour intervals, that's four hours that you have them putting pressure on bony areas such as their coccyx. Does that make any sense? Absolutely not. So we're going to throw that one out. Then you have choice number two, keeping the head of the bed in high phallus position to increase circulation. You want to know what happens when you put that patient in high phallus position? You put that head in high phallus, right? So you're putting that bed in high phallus. Guess what that patient keeps doing? Sliding down the bed, sliding down the bed, sliding down the bed. And every time they slide down that bed, that's producing shearing forces between the sheet and that patient's skin, okay? Which allows for what? Skin breakdown. So absolutely not. Patients who are prone to having ulcers, patients who are prone to having skin breakdown, we don't want the head of that bed high. We want it low because we don't want that shearing force that's going to happen if you have the head of the bed high. Choice number four, encouraging the client to perform pelvic muscle training exercises several times a day. That help, does, helps nothing with pressure. Pelvic training exercises does nothing for pressure and that's the problem that the patient has. We wanna keep pressure off of them. So the best in this situation is having that schedule and making sure that that patient is turning, that that patient's being repositioned at least every two hours. For the next question, okay. When turning a client, the nurse notices a reddened area on the coccyx. What skin intervention should the nurse use on this area? One, clean the area with mild soap, dry, and add a protective moisturizer. Two, apply a dilute hydrogen peroxide and water mixture and use a heat lamp to the area. Three, soak the area in normal saline. Four, wash the area with astringent and paint Paint it with povidine iodine, also known as betadine. I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. I didn't mean to laugh. Okay, so the correct answer is one. You want to clean the area with mild, not harsh soaps, right? It says mild soap, dry, and then you want to add a protective barrier. 
Look at our other choices. Two, dilute, apply dilute hydrogen peroxide. No, let's stop right there. That hydrogen peroxide is going to cause skin breakdown. We don't want that. Choice number three, soak. Stop right there. You don't ever want to soak because what does that soaking do? It's going to cause skin breakdown. It causes uh, maceration of the skin. That's why we always want that skin to be dry. That's why, remember, I think I told you just in the last question, or maybe two questions ago, I don't recall, but patients who are at risk for skin breakdown are patients who are what? Incontinent. Because the urine, the feces that sits there on the skin will cause skin breakdown. So you don't want to soak the patient's skin at all because that moisture will add to skin breakdown. And then you have four, wash the area with astringent. Excuse me, absolutely not. That is harsh and it's gonna cause excessive drying, okay? So your only correct answer here is the mild, mild soap. And then you wanna dry it. You wanna make sure that skin's dry and then put a protective barrier on the skin. Next question. A client comes to the ER department following an injury. The nurse implements appropriate first aid for the client when, one, removing any penetrating objects, two, elevating an, effective, an affected part that's bleeding, three, vigorously cleaning areas of abrasion or laceration, four, keeping any puncture wounds from bleeding. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. The correct answer is two, you want to elevate the affected part that is bleeding, okay? So guys, you want to apply pressure to the site and you want to elevate it to decrease the bleeding. Let's look at our other choices. You have one, removing any penetrating objects. Look at me in my eyeball when I tell you this. You do not pull out any penetrating objects. Do you hear me? Because that penetrating object may be what's keeping that patient from hemorrhaging out. The minute you pull it out, that patient's blood is splurting all over the place. Okay? You leave that to the surgeon when that patient's in surgery, but you're not pulling anything out of that patient. Okay? That penetrating object may be what's stabilizing that patient hemodynamically speaking. Okay? So never, ever, ever in the history of your nursing career are you going to pull out any penetrating object. Are we clear? Good. Choice number three, vigorously stop, pump the brakes. You know what vigorously means? That means harshly. That means you, to do something in a hard way. That means to do something roughly. Do we do anything vigorously in nursing? No. Vigorously cleaning areas of abrasion or laceration? Absolutely not. You may cause more harm and damage than good, okay? You're not going to vigorously clean anything. You're going to do it delicately, okay? And choice four, keeping any puncture wound um, from bleeding. If something, um, if the patient has a puncturing wound, how are you going to keep it from bleeding? By doing number two, putting pressure on the side and L of, uh, pressure on the side if you can, if there's, um, uh, um, uh, if, putting pressure on the actual site and not what's puncturing the patient, okay? So applying pressure and doing what? Elevating that affected extremity. That's how you decrease the bleeding, okay? And you see this question, the answer of to elevating the affected part that's bleeding, that is an umbrella answer. And we love umbrella answers, guys. Remember I taught you guys about umbrella answers on my video, um, 11 tips on passing NCLEX. This is a perfect example. Why? Because number two covers number four, which says keeping the puncture wounds from bleeding. And that's what you guys want to do. Next question. The nurse is concerned that the client's mid-sternal wound is at risk for dehiscence. Which of the following is the best intervention to prevent this complication? One, administering antibiotics to prevent infection. Two, using appropriate sterile technique when changing the dressing. Three, keeping sterile towels and extra dressing supplies near the client's bed. Four, placing a pillow over the incision site when the client is deep breathing or coughing. And I'll give you a moment. The correct answer is four, having the client use a pillow over the incision site when they're coughing or deep breathing. Why? That keeps those sutures from busting wide open, also known as dehiscence, okay? 
So when they use a pillow, what does that pillow act as? A splint. And you want a patient to splint the area when they're coughing, when they're deep breathing in order not to um, cause any dehiscence to the wound site. Next question. Following a head injury, the client has thin drainage coming from the left ear. The nurse describes this drainage as one, serous, two, purulent, three, seros, cerebrospinal fluid, or four, serosanguinous? And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer is one, serous fluid. Serous fluid, guys, it looks um, clear, watery. And let's go back to the question that says, following a head injury, the client has thin drainage, it's coming from the left ear, how would you describe it? Let's look at our other choices. So you have two, which is purulent. When you see that word purulent, that means something that looks or appears to be infectious. So with purulent drainage, you would expect it to be thick, yellow or green. You'd expect it to be malodorous, right? You have um, choice three, cerebral spinal fluid. Now guys, cerebral spinal fluid, you're not going to know unless you test it, okay? But I'll give you some indicators. If you see that the leakage is clear, but you see a yellow ring around it, most likely it's cerebral spinal fluid, or you test it with the dipstick and it tests positive for glucose, cerebral spinal fluid, but you have to test it. You can't just say cerebral spinal fluid from looking at it, okay? Like you would be able to look at serous fluid and say, okay, this is serious because you know it's clear, it's watery. And then you have your choice four, which is a serosanguinous fluid. That's when it's like pale reddish color. When it's a pale reddish color and it could be mixed with clear red, it might maybe it gives you a pink tinge. That's your one that's serosanguinous, okay? So that's the difference between those four descriptions. Next question. The nurse recognizes that skin integrity can be compromised by being exposed to body fluids. The greatest risk exists for the client who has exposure to one, urine, two, purulent exudates, three, pancreatic fluids, or four, serosanguinous drainage. And I'll give you a moment. So the correct answer is three, pancreatic fluids. Now, I'm going to do this a little bit backwards. I'm going to explain to you, go over the other choices first, then I'm going to go over the correct choice. So you see one and two, a urine and purulent exudates. Those place, they do, they place the patient at risk for um, decreased skin integrity but not number one risk. So those are risk factors. I want to make it sure that I, that's clear. Those are risk factors, but it's not on top of the list, okay? Let me tell you why pancreatic fluids is on top of the list. If you guys can recall, on one of the first videos I ever did, it, actually diabetes is so important, I did a couple of videos on diabetes. But anyway, I talked to you guys and I explained about the endocrine and exogenous functions of the pancreas, right? And one of the things that I explained to you that the pancreas does is that it releases pancreatic enzymes, all right? So every time you eat something, you put food in your mouth, the pancreas is supposed to shoot out these pancreatic pancreatic enzymes so when the food goes from your stomach to your small intestine those pancreatic enzymes break down the food so that you can digest the food okay so guess what those pancreatic enzymes do what break things down so if you get pancreatic enzymes on the skin what do you think it's going to do to your skin break your skin down that's how harsh pancreatic enzymes do that's how harsh pancreatic enzymes are. That's its function. It breaks things down. So when you have to compare pancreatic enzymes to the urine or feces or vomit or any other bodily fluids, yes, any bodily fluids put patients at risk for skin breakdown, but nothing like pancreatic enzymes do because pancreatic, pancreatic enzymes work a lot faster. They will break that skin down a lot faster and a lot harsher 
okay, than the other bodily fluids that I just mentioned. So that's why the correct answer is number three. Next question. When cleaning a wound, the nurse should one, wash over the wound twice and discard that swab. Two, move from the outer region of the wound to the center. Three, start at the drainage site and move out in circular motions. Or four, start an antiseptic solution followed by normal saline rinse. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer is three. You want to start at the drainage site and move out with circular motions. Okay. You want to you want to um, clean uh, start at cleanest and move out. Okay. Not at the dirtiest and move in because if you start outwards and you move in, you're pushing it all where in the center. Absolutely not. Okay. You guys learned this in first semester of nursing program. In the nursing program, you want to start in the center where the drainage is and move your way out. Okay. One says wash over the wound twice and discard uh, that swab. No, once and discard. Okay. You want to keep sterility. Um, I explained to you why two is a wrong answer. What's four? Use an antiseptic solution followed by normal saline no opposite you're going to clean it out first you're going to use the normal saline then you're going to use the antiseptic solution if ordered okay so the only correct answer in this choice is three starting the drainage at the drainage site and moving outwards in circular motion just like i taught you or just like i showed you i should say the nurse is aware that application of cold is indicated for the client with one menstrual cramping two, an infected wound, three, a fractured ankle, or four, degenerative joint disease. And I'll give you a moment. The correct answer is a fractured ankle. Remember guys, when you have fracture, you have sprain, you have a uh, um, uh, strain, you wanna do rice, R-I-C-E, okay? R is for rest, you wanna rest that affected area. You have I is for ice. Why are you putting ice? Ice, um, anything that's cold causes constriction. And of course, if there's a fracture, you're going to expect a lot of what? Swelling. So you're going to put ice to cause constriction to decrease the swelling to that area. C is for compression. Of course, E, elevation. And the elevation does the same thing. It helps decrease the swelling. Let's look at our other choices. One, menstrual cramping. Actual for menstrual cramping, you want to use heat warmth because warmth causes what vasodilation okay so warmth relaxes smooth muscles and it causes vasodilation which will help with the pain look at choice two infected wound you don't put cold on an infected wound because cold causes what constriction and it decreases blood flow when there's an infection you want blood flow because remember that blood flow is bringing what oxygen vitamins nutrients so you're not going to put cold on the wound. However, you don't put heat either either because heat causes what? Just like cold, cold causes vasoconstriction and it decreases blood flow, heat causes vasodilation. And yes, vasodilation increases blood flow, but guess what? Vasodilation will also spread the infection. So you're not putting heat or cold on an infection. You're cleaning out that infection. So the answer can't be number two and degenerative joint disease. For patients that have degenerative, degenerative joint disease, you want warmth. You want to bring warmth to the side. It's going to cause muscle relaxation and it's going to be soothing to the patient. So the correct, only correct answer for this question when it comes to patient that had a fracture, it's going... Um, um, excuse me, uh, the patient that you're going to put cold on is going to be that patient that had a fracture. R-I-C-E, rest, ice, compression, and elevation. The client requires support and an abdominal binder is ordered. The nurse correctly implements the use of a binder by one, using it as a replacement for underlying dressings, two, keeping it loose for client comfort, Three, having the client sit or stand when it is applied. Four, making sure the client has adequate ventilatory capacity. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. 
The correct answer is four. You want to make sure that the client can breathe. Okay? That's the correct answer. Let's look at our other choices. One, using it as a replacement for underlying dressing. Absolutely not. Okay? That binder goes over any dressings that the patient has. It doesn't replace the dressing. It goes on top of the dressing. Okay? Choice number two, keeping it loose for comfort comfort no it needs to be snug notice i didn't say tight that patient has to be able to breathe but it needs to be snug okay otherwise it's not going to be effective three having the client sit or stand when it's applied no when you're applying it on the patient they should be lying down and then you have the correct answer making sure the client has adequate ventilatory capacity you want to make sure that they can breathe with it on okay And our last question, to reduce pressure points that may lead to pressure ulcers, the nurse should one, position the client directly on the trochanter when side lying, two, use a donut device for the client when sitting up, three, elevate the head of bed as little as possible, or four, massage over bony prominences. And I'll give you a moment. Although I, I gave you the answer to this question a couple questions ago. So let's see if you were paying attention. The correct answer is three, elevate the head as little as possible. Remember I explained to you, we don't want the shearing forces. When you elevate the head of the bed, what happens? The patient keeps sliding down. They keep sliding down. So you don't want that to happen. You don't want that to cause skin breakdown. So you're going to elevate the head of the bed as least as little as possible. Let's look at our other choices. You have number one, it says position the client directly on the trochanter. Stop. Did I not tell you? In order to av avoid pressure also, you have to make sure that you keep that patient off of bony prominences. So why would you have them lying down on the trochanter? So you know that can't be right. So we're getting rid of that. Choice number two, use a donut device for the client when they're sitting up. No. Why? That donut device, you put it on that client while they're sitting up. What does that do? It decreases the blood supply, which decreases blood, oxygen, vitamins, nutrients. They're supposed to go to that area. So throw that out. That's not the answer. And then number four, massage over bony prominences. Never. Guess what? You, when you're massaging over that bony prominences, when you're giving somebody a massage, what are you doing? You're applying what? Pressure. What causes an ulcer? Pressure over a bony prominences. So over a bony prominence. So why would you give a patient a massage over that same bony prominence that you don't want to put pressure over? Does that make any sense? So guys, the correct answer is having that head of the bed as low as possible. I hope you guys don't mind me yelling at you from what my students have told me. They say, Professor D, you know, when I was taking my NCLEX, when I was taking my test, I remember you yelling at me about such and such, or I'm going to tell you guys a secret. My students, I choke them sometimes. I do. If they say something crazy, I'll come up behind and just squeeze their neck. And they'll say to me, they'll say, Professor D, I remember you doing that and I, I chose the right answer. So I hope you guys didn't get offended if I was yelling at you too much. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you haven't done so already, please make sure you like, comment, and subscribe below. Like I said, guys, this was part one of the two-part video. So please watch out for part two. Thank you so much for joining me and I'll see you next time.